Hello there, you're watching Reality Check Friday Report on NDTV. I'm Maha Siddiqui. China's all-powerful president Xi Jinping was faced with a rare protest just days before a crucial Communist Party Congress. Here's a look at some of the dramatic visuals that have emerged from China, where you can see smoke emanating from the flyover from where the banners were hung and then a swift removal of the banners as well. Now, not only was this rare, it was also scathing because they called him an authoritarian leader and also a traitor, asking for an end to the hardline zero COVID policy and the overthrow of Xi Jinping. Two banners hung over a busy Beijing intersection. One of the banners saying, go on strike, remove the dictator and the national traitor Xi Jinping, unquote. China is infamously associated with brutal crackdown on any dissent or protest. The 1989 Tiananmen Square students protest may be three decades old, but there are newer, if not so glaring examples. Take a look. Over the last few months, there have been corruption trials against party senior members, death sentences commuted to life in prison for three, jail term as long as 10 years for three former police and security chiefs, Dozens of probes by internal watchdog of the Communist Party have been launched as well. Now, while all this may be passed off as a crackdown on corruption, many argue that this is to ensure that there are no hurdles created in the path of Xi Jinping's unprecedented third term as party chief and hence the president of China, consolidating even more power. On Reality Check Friday report, we ask, who dares Xi? and whether, even if small, this reflects a serious challenge to him. Joining us now on the show, our guests here are with us. Let me quickly introduce them to you. Uh, Jonah Blanca, uh, who is a foreign policy expert, Major General Sanjay Mestin, defense analyst, KC Singh, former diplomat, strategic affairs expert, Dr. Tara Kartha, former Director, National Security Council Secretariat, will be joining us shortly. And Professor Victor Gao, spokesperson of the Chinese Communist Party. Professor Gao, I want to first come to you. How big a setback would you say uh, this uh, banner of defiance is for President Xi, who's at the cusp of acquiring undisputed power in China? Thank you very much for having me. I'm living in Beijing, and I can assure you, Beijing is as safe as you can be. And people are very, very calm, and no one is agitated about what happened yesterday. Now, what happened yesterday was about the control of COVID-19. Allow me to emphasize, China has achieved the greatest success of mankind in fighting off COVID-19. Now, in this process, it does have created a lot of inconveniences for individuals, including people like me. But all of us know for sure that all these inconveniences on personal levels are meant for a greater good. That is to save as many Chinese people from dying from COVID infections and from getting infections. So I would say the overwhelming majority of the Chinese people know why we are doing this dynamic COVID zero policy and the overwhelming majority of the Chinese people support the Chinese government in the COVID-19 policy. I would say the Chinese success really compares in a very sharp term with many other countries which have failed miserably in saving their people and preventing the widespread of the COVID-19. So I think China should be very proud of its very rare and great profound successes in fighting off the COVID-19 pandemic. All of us support this policy. All of us are beneficiaries of this very successful zero COVID policy. All right. Professor Gao, you are saying that this uh, uh, dissent that came through was only with regards to COVID-19. But there have been terms like traitor used against the president, which I'm sure has been pretty shocking for most people. And we'll just, those, that is the banner uh, that uh, has been propped up there earlier on, which was then taken off, which actually used these words, authoritarian, traitor. Come on, China is a population of 1.4 billion 
and you are calling from New Delhi, and the Chinese population as of today is still a little bit larger than India's, is that right? And we are very diversified. Every one of us has an opinion, politically, economically, in the terms of our social lives. Everyone is entitled to some kind of his or her own views. Therefore, I would be allowed, I hope, to emphasize the mega trend. That is, China is safe and stable, and everything is peaceful and tranquil. And whatever noises there are in different parts of China do not reflect the overall realities on the ground. We need to look at the big picture. The big picture, big picture is no country is as united as China is today okay. and going forward. All right. Uh, let me also introduce another guest who's joining us on the show, Raymond Vickery. Uh, Raymond Vickery is the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Commerce. But let me uh, first go across to Jonah Blank. Uh, I want to ask you about the explanation that Professor Gao is giving there, saying that there are diverse opinions and some of them have come through. But uh, the fact remains that this may seem like a small protest, but the timing is important here because uh, he's just at the cusp of acquiring this great power, taking an unprecedented third term as the general secretary of the party. How should this protest then be read in that light? Quite right. Uh, this is enormously embarrassing for Xi Jinping, and the uh, the impact on the people who have protested will be dire. I think we should assume that they will be thrown into prison and possibly suffer uh, even worse consequences than that. The fact that they were willing to do this, knowing the consequences, shows just how much frustration there is out there. Nobody knows, not me, not uh, the spokesman for the CCP, not Xi Jinping himself, nobody knows exactly how deep the dissatisfaction goes. And that is what really must be somewhat frightening to the leadership of the CCP. Personally, I don't think that Xi Jinping is under any direct threat right now, mm. but the fact that it is such a closed authoritarian system means that nobody will know until it is too late. Dr. Tara Karta, one would ask, how was this even possible in China when security is heightened ahead of the Communist Party Congress? Uh, could this be more than what meets the eye then? Could this have the support of some other leaders, say, an attempt to derail President Xi's rise? See, I think logically, in any, any system, if a leader sort of decides that he's going to go on forever, there's going to be a lot of unhappy people around I mean, regardless of, you're going to see that with Putin as well, I'm sure, pretty soon. So there, he has also created a cult. I mean, China generally had a kind of a unified consensus building kind of a body, the way they govern. This is now a personality cult, which a lot of people don't like. He's changed the rule. He's changed everything in terms of who's going to be elected to the next Congress. They've removed the age barrier. So all power is now in his hands. And a lot of people are not going to like that. That is one. Second is, what has he done to business? With the COVID, you know, with the zero COVID, business has been hit so badly. And I'm pretty sure the economy is far worse than they're talking of, I think, a 2.7% growth, which is what being predicted. I think it's worse than that. And the third thing, which is most important, I think, is the severe demoralization among the youth. You know, in the middle of, you know, of lack of employment, you know, the lack, you can't, you can't speak. I mean, you had the person who was saying that, you know, China, anyone can speak. They, they can't. A young person has no jobs. Is that what they call 996 economy, nine to nine, six days a week. And he's got nowhere to, he can't even tell anyone. He's got no one to speak to. He's got no outlet. That is why this is significant. This is, as the person had said, it shows amazing courage. I mean, this person, I hats off to him that he could stand up and say this in, in front of the public. And he's mm. being absolutely supported across social media. There is drought. The economy is bad. Mm. Industry is bad. Private industry, 10 cent is going to lay off people again. So what's going to happen? It is a, it is a very bad situation. Raymond Vickery, is this discontent that is emerging uh, from the economic situation as Dr. Uh, Kartha is uh, suggesting here? 
Well, I think it's emerging from the economic situation, but not solely from the economic situation. What is going on here is uh, that Xi has decided that uh, China will go back uh, in time uh, to a more authoritarian uh, prospect as opposed to opening up both in terms of the economy uh, and politically. So it can't be confined uh, just to economic matters, but there's no question that that uh, fuels it. Uh, when people uh, don't feel that they are better off today than they were uh, yesterday, the opportunities are limited and it's just being dictated and everything is being uh, done from a top-down perspective. Uh, as the speakers have said, there's, go there's going to be reaction to it. And it's just a measure of the authoritarianism that this one uh, protest uh, received so much uh, attention hmm. because uh, the iron hand uh, is being uh, put forward uh, in this Congress. Uh, it's unprecedented, as you have said, to have a third uh, term for it. And uh, the economic uh, consequences are not good for uh, China. You need an open system. You need to be able to uh, have uh, competition in order to have economic growth seem to be the case these days in China. Okay. Iron hand, a lot of adjectives they use to describe uh, uh, the situation there. Authoritarian Professor Gao doesn't agree with uh, most of these adjectives used. However, uh, Major General Mestin, security wise, and we all know how heightened the security uh, when we are, they have 2,300 approximately delegates coming in for uh, the Congress uh, of the Communist Party. Security wise, something that would clearly be viewed in China's impunity. How was this even possible? The putting up of banners, as is being called on social media, an act of courage, would you say? Uh, Maha, good evening. Uh, good I would definitely say from the security perspective, I think it is highly laudable that a person, and I would say it would be many persons, but one person has taken the initiative of protester, and he has done it in the heart of Beijing, and that too on the very significant bridge, and the timing matters. So I think, uh, as brought out earlier, this person has been really remarkable, a man of full courage, conviction, guts. Uh, as a security analyst, I would like to highlight. And therefore, whatever he has done, I think he's expressed resentment on behalf of the many Chinese. And I had myself been to China for a military exercise in 2005. I recollect uh, that uh, when the liaison officer was detailed, you know, during the informal conversations, it erupted, and even as on date, we know the uh, there is a tremendous uh, divide in the rural areas. There is a lot of, uh, I would say, people are very, very backward. Economic development is uh, marginal. It is only in the cities what we see. So, therefore, this resentment is bound to be there. And as highlighted, I think dictatorial, authoritative uh, leaders will always face this. Now, coming from the security perspective, you know, uh, what happens is, uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Gao said that there is stability and there is peace. I did, uh, uh, firstly, I think uh, the definition of uh, security and peace needs to be understood. If there is stability, then why uh, ban the internet? Why his, uh, everything has been disappeared from the internet? So there is no freedom of uh, uh, you know, expression. There is no freedom of free speech. And therefore, in how... They can call this as terms of uh, stability and peace. Hmm. So I think from uh, overall security perspective and coming on to the Chinese armed forces, see, uh, the, uh, you are well aware that they have political commissars. So hold of CCP is so much in the entire system. So I think uh, these protests uh, definitely may not spark a total uh, kind of a protest. Hmm. But definitely, I think a lot of message goes to the international world and especially to President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping that there is something amiss. Okay. And if the, the mm. things are not corrected at the appropriate time, mm. because how this has happened in the heart of Beijing is something uh, the security lapses have occurred. And probably this person has well time, maybe he's done it in the night, put the banners and that too on a very uh, uh, important, significant bridge, which is a landmark. So I think uh, Maha, my uh, take on this is that I agree with most of the speakers okay. uh, that the authoritative and dictatorial rule, these things can't happen and a stage does come right. where people start uh, protesting but in a country like China or mm -hmm. Iran mm -hmm. or Russia, 
it is difficult but hmm. yes be, uh, there is high time that people will uh, express but not their, impossible their as we've seen here uh, difficult but not impossible ambassador saying how do you read this dissent in a country like china and specifically the timing look firstly it's no tenanmen square as some of the other channels are saying it's not the numbers that are important it's the timing and the way it has been done because it then fed into social media it may be one or two or three people who did it but the banners done the damage because it's the message and then it went into social media and the reason that people reason the government panicked was that the people started spreading it which means they were supporting the message and what is feeding into that is you see there's a compact between the people of china and the rulers of china and the compact is that you do not assert your political rights what we will give you economic progress will give you prosperity now the economy is slowing down uh, there is a real estate crisis in june there were riots when a bank uh, you know packed up and people couldn't withdraw their money so when the economic factors come in and i think economic factors have been worsened by the handling of covid hmm. i disagree with the professor gao that has been a very successful thing actually zero covid is a disaster because what they've done is they not allowed the first couple of years it's the other countries that suffered and the chinese were sitting back and just saying look we are successful although it spread from china but the mistake they made was they didn't allow their population to develop immunity because the zero covid is that you isolate and you catch the people who have got the infection and test everyone and which means you fight the virus you don't allow people to develop immunity and that is not catching up with them because long shutdowns of major manufacturing centers in china have of course caused a problem in elsewhere in terms of supply lines uh, but in china itself has slowed the economy hmm. and then on top of that when you are an assertive leader and you take on the west hmm. just a couple of days ago the us president has come out with his national security policy and he talks of china being the main problem and russia being a secondary problem and for us is china and pakistan that this is going to be the problem in the future hmm. no because he is irritated the west or made them aware of the challenge he is presenting before china has been able to fully rise i think he's done it prematurely and that is the danger that deng xiaoping always flagged hmm. that have orderly rise don't show your claws i think after the 2008 banking crisis uh chinese got overconfident they thought they had already arrived and they were now the main power then they, they going to challenge the americans hmm. now the americans have hit back so they hitting them in terms of chips they are controlling the flow of technology to china hmm. and the effect of that will begin to show all right as that uh, comes up right. and on top of that you got the ukraine war the chinese are stuck between the russians and the west hmm. they are sympathetic to the russians they don't know be in the russian corner beyond a certain time so it's a very difficult it was a very difficult time for the 20th congress where xi jinping thing wanted an orderly happy congress All which right. then endorses a so, third term and which means it's an endless number of terms let, once let you me, break let, the convention let me take yeah. that thought forward with professor gao professor gao most people on the panel believe that uh, economic issues the handling of covid situation has not worked in favor of president xi what then do you believe or would be uh, the path ahead for him as he assumes this uh, a larger than life uh, figure for himself within china uh, his term as president will be extended he'll become uh, the third time he'll be the general secretary of the party but is his path forward fraught with challenges First of all, with due respect to everyone on this distinguished table, allow me to emphasize: I'm the only person here in China uh, among all the panelists here. Is that right? So I'm shocked to hear all these voices, which completely deviate, deviate from the realities on the ground. Allow me to emphasize several mega things, which are assured, which will happen. One is that the 20th Party Congress is happening in one day's time. I will be a major commentator on the television about that, and I will assure you, China and the Communist Party of China, which has a pop membership of up to about 100 million, will be as united as ever, and the 20th Party Congress will be one of the most important political events in China with global implications. 
It will take place. It will be very successful. It will unite the whole party and the whole nation. That's one. Now, in terms of economic development, don't forget, China is already larger than the United States in terms of the size of the economy. If we use purchasing power parity, if we use official exchange rate, at the end of 2021, China already was about 80 percent that of the United States. China's size is more than five times bigger that of Japan. Uh, sorry, that of India. So. When we compare the Chinese economic development, yes, indeed, it is experiencing some difficulties. Every year over the past 43 years, China experienced different kinds of challenges and difficulties. But compared with the United States, Germany, France, Japan, or the United Kingdom, for example, the Chinese economy is doing well. By the end of this year, the growth rate in China will be higher than almost all the other major economies in the world. So I'm very agitated to see that you are worrying your heads off about the Chinese economy. From my perspective in Beijing, I keep worrying about all the other major economies, the G7 economies, for example. Don't worry about the Chinese economy. We will sort out the difficulties. That's another mega point. Now, in terms of the fight against the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, in China, we believe the herd immunity is a failure of the government. They do not pick up their responsibility. They fail in their responsibility of saving their own people. And we are shocked to see that one, more than one million people die in the United States. Comparing with a very small number of deaths, a very small number of infections in China, do you really call China as a failure? And the United States, for example, as a success, you just confuse the right and the wrong. China is the greatest success in fighting off COVID-19. Do you really believe that the Chinese people do not know that? Other things being equal, on a purely pro rata basis, if the United States suffered one million deaths in China, we would have suffered hmm. 4.5 million deaths. And if you assume that the United States is better endowed in terms of the public health resources, then you double that up. That means China would have lost about 10 million people because of the COVID. Now, China is up and running. We periodically experience some bounces back of the infections and we can scramble into action. We can fight it off. China is now the only country in the world which has the resources, the political commitment and the national re right. uh, national uh, mobili mobilization mm -hmm. capabilities and the internet connections for example mm. to enable the whole population to participate in this fight against the covid name any other country in the world all right that Pro has these capabilities all right. i would say mm. if you believe your parents are saved your uncles are saved and your niece is still alive uh, now you will know how much of a heroic struggle China mm. has put up with against this pandemic. All right. You should be proud of our achievements rather than feeling sorry about our huge successes. All Thank right. you. Professor Gao, uh, I gave you enough time because, yes, I understand you are one uh, against five people over here with divergent views. Uh, so let me go across first to uh, Raymond Hickory now, uh, and uh, Raymond Vickery, sorry. And I'll be only able to give 30, 20 seconds each to all my panelists now because we've completely run out of time. Raymond Vickery, respond to the point on economy that was made by Professor Gao. Well, I think the professor is uh, a, a spokesman for authoritarianism because he, he, China is the greatest in everything. Uh, he admits that there are a lot of different views in China, but we don't hear any different views. Economically, uh, it's uh, forbidden to say anything bad about the China economy. So uh, it's, this is a typical authoritarian approach to it. It's unlike India and the United States where you have really talk uh, about realities. Hmm. So, All right. Uh, so I'll the, have to interrupt you there. Only 20 seconds each. Dr. Karta, economy. I think while I agree, China has definitely made a It's a huge rise. I mean, let's, let's face that. They have done it. But the point is at what cost? 
and that's what you're seeing on that bridge today that the youth that is a university town Hmm. The young people are fed up and tired and that is the key to your future. All right. I'll stop there. Jonah Blank. Yes. There's no country in the world that has been successful in managing COVID, but democracies at least let people throw out their government if they feel they've done a bad job. The United States did, a, in my view, a very poor job under the previous president, and that was one of the reasons that the American people voted him out. The people of China do not have that ability. So we really don't know how much anger there is below the surface. Okay. Ambassador Singh, just 10 seconds to you, sir, and Major General uh, Mestin uh, on the herd no. immunity point. Ambassador Singh. No, I think China is at an inflection point. There's going to be a slowdown. They, they offended uh, a lot of countries by their aggressive behavior. And I think without herd immunity hmm. uh, and without mass vaccination, they're going to have a serious problem if they keep locking up because we have a winter coming up. Okay. And the virus goes on mutating. All right. And once well, it mutates, they'll face a new challenge. May General Messon, last, uh, uh, last statement for you. Yeah. In China, the truth is hidden. Life example is Galwan clashes. China as a nation or the CCP refused to acknowledge their own killed, own casualties. Why they didn't uh, tell their own people? Right. And it came out from Russia later. So okay. they, uh, this is the way China is. They hide things and they don't reveal the all truth. All right, we'll have to leave it at that. We are completely out of time. Many thanks to all of you for joining us here on the show. With that, we're taking a very quick break.